It's earnings day and you're going to be speaking with us while you're out on a bit of a hiking trip. Talk to us about the key dro driver of growth that you saw in the previous quarter and now looking forward. Um, ironically, um, COVID um, did help the industry quite a bit, uh, even though uh, we've had to change a lot of our uh, procedures. We've had to change the way we sell our products. Um, uh, you know, we were deemed essential as an industry that put a lot of pressure on us to make sure we could keep our customers and our employees safe. Um, but demand picked up quite a bit because a lot of new customers entered the market, uh, people that had not used cannabis before, people using it for anxiety, for stress. Uh, and so we did see a very substantial pickup in demand in the second quarter. Uh, we ended the quarter with $121.4 million of revenue, uh, which was a 120% increase over the last year's. Uh, it was about a 16% sequential increase. We also had a very profitable quarter with $28 million in EBITDA, which was a 140% increase over last year uh, and about a 22% increase sequentially over the last quarter. We closed the grassroots transaction, making Cura Leaf the largest cannabis company in the world, and certainly in the United States. Uh, and we've been integrating our acquisition we made the yeah. first quarter select at, and moving that brand across the whole country. So it was a very busy uh, six months for us. But uh, um, even in these difficult uh, circumstances that we're all living in, the company did very well. So, Boris, then, given those numbers, given those good numbers, and then put that against the backdrop of uh, the, the economic conditions, the labor market conditions, at least here in the U.S., where things, while improving, uh, are still not where we were pre-pandemic, talk to me about the, just the general elasticity that you see with regards to consumer demand for cannabis products, uh, given sort of the backdrop that we're in right now. I mean, I, I think that... Uh... Uh, certainly, you know, we can't, we're no different than any other consumer goods company, although uh, we, are, we are a new industry, it's a new product, a lot of people haven't tried it, um, and as you know, the illicit market in the United States is estimated to be somewhere between 75 and 100 billion. The legal market, which is the market that we obviously operate in, is about $16 billion, so there's a tremendous amount of growth just taking it, clients, patients from the illicit market, moving them into the legal market. And that's given us a little bit more of, of a cushion and a little bit more strength, I think, than some of the other companies. But obviously, if the environment continues to deteriorate, if people continue to lose jobs, that will have an impact on all industries. At the moment, I have to say that we haven't seen any kind of uh, let up in the cannabis industry. We continue to grow. It looks like we're going to have another you know, 25 percent uh, quarter on quarter growth going into the third quarter. So, so far things look good, but we're not forecasting, for instance, more than a quarter ahead because of the COVID situation. Uh, COVID aside, curious, what extra percent on top and bottom line do you see from states expanding not just from medical marijuana, but legalized recreational use? Or do you need to see federal legislation? No, um, I think that the November is going to be a watershed month, irrespective of the federal government. We've got both New Jersey and Arizona, uh, um, you know, have ballot initiatives for uh, adult use uh, legalization. You're going to, they're polling very well, so both states will likely pass it. And I think New Jersey's the more important one, because if New Jersey goes, it's obvious that New York, Governor Cuomo said that they'd likely go, Pennsylvania and Connecticut will go. Uh, and that you have basically 80 percent of the U.S. population this time next year will have access to adult use cannabis. And so I think from our industry, from our business perspective, that's a lot more important at the moment than where the federal government is. But I don't believe the federal government will be able to ignore whether you have a Biden or a Trump presidency. They can't ignore the fact that consumers are, are, are using 80 percent of the U.S. consumer base has access and is using cannabis and there's no federal legislation around it. So something will have to come up, whether it's SAFE Act, which is a banking act, whether it's uh, 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 States Act, which is giving the states the right to mandate their own rules for cannabis, which is largely what, what the gambling industry does. Mm. Something will have to come out of the federal government, whether it's a Biden or a Trump administration. Boris, you're the largest cannabis company by market value. You've got the scale, you've convinced them the analysts of that, that it's being put to good work. I'm interested as to who your competitor is going forward. In the longer term, does it remain other rival cannabis companies? Are you looking for pivots coming from the tobacco industry, from the alcohol industry, for example, CPG companies? Our biggest competitor is the illicit market, the street drug dealer that continues to sell illegal vapes and illegal uh, flour that buys it usually from Oregon and California. 
uh, that continues to be the largest competitor to Cureleaf. Our other, the other companies, I mean, as I said, it's a $100 billion market with a 15 to $16 billion sales rate uh, this year. And so at the moment, you know, until we get to around the 35 to $50 billion market, I think that the illicit market is our biggest competitor. Obviously, if you get federal regulation and you get the big tobacco and the consumer goods companies involved, they will become competition, significant competition for us. But we think that that's probably two to three years out. Uh, and so at the moment, as our main competition is still the black illicit market.